Yes, thank you for standing. As we continue our series in the book of Deuteronomy this morning, we'll be hearing from and reading from Deuteronomy chapter 27. So hear now the word of the Lord. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on them all the words of this law. When you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I, am, I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. And you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write on them, this, on the stones, all the words of this law very plainly. Then Moses and the Levitical priests said to all Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. That day Moses charged the people, saying, When you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to the men, all the men of Israel, in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed, cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's nakedness, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look to you for you have the words of eternal life. And we are amazed even as we think of the care and love you have for us that you would give us your word. Your word which not only tells us how we are to live but what we are to believe about you. And Father, we pray that you would know, we would know you better uh, through uh, the words of Pastor Trent this morning that we would come to see you in your, your character and, uh, and your love for us and your care for us and in how holy and just you are. We pray that you would shape, uh, re realign and retune our minds and also shape our hearts to follow more after yours. And it's in Jesus' name, for his glory we pray, amen. You may be seated.
Well, as we approach Halloween, I wonder, do you believe in curses? Hollywood certainly does, and perhaps for good reason. The story of one such curse is connected with a novel from 1963 called The Incomparable Atuk. The details of this story are not interesting or important. But what is important is that some years after the novel was written, a writer by the name of Todd Carroll wanted to turn that novel into a film. And so he did exactly that, and then he recruited his good friend, John Belushi, to play the role of the lead actor and uh, the lead character in this novel-turned-film. Unfortunately, after Belushi accepted the, role, accepted the role, before he was able to actually do the film, he was found dead of a drug overdose in his hotel room at 33. After Belushi, another the comedic actor by the name of Sam Kinison was recruited to play the lead role in this novel adapted to film. Kinison began the production process, but unfortunately, due to his alcoholism and bad behavior on set, they had to pause production. When they finally resumed production again, unfortunately, Kinison was killed by a drunk driver. After Kennison, another comedic actor was recruited to play the lead role by the name of John Candy. Candy accepted the opportunity to play in this film, but as he just finished up what would be his last film, Wagons East, John Candy was found dead in his hotel room of a likely heart attack, perhaps caused at least in part by his longtime addiction to smoking his obesity, and his occasional dabbling in cocaine. After John Candy, an actor by the name of Chris Farley was recruited to play the lead role along with his friend, Phil Hartman. John Candy, sorry, Chris Farley, after accepting the role, was also found dead at the age of 33, like his idol, Belushi, before he actually got to make this film. The supporting actor, Phil Hartman, who was going to play alongside of him, was also found dead, killed by his wife, who then killed herself and was found to have had alcohol, cocaine, and Zoloft in her system at the time of the crime. At this point, Film executives seized the screenplay, and the film remains unmade to this day. <laughs> you believe in curses? <clears throat> I do. But in this particular case, the curse is not so much some kind of a magical, shamanistic, Halloween type of curse that seems to be at play, but rather the curse of alcohol and drug addiction and essentially the natural consequences that occur when we engage in a particular type of lifestyle. This curse seems to be more of just another way of speaking about natural consequences of bad decisions by those extraordinarily talented people or the people who were close to them. In this section of Deuteronomy, for the next several chapters, we're going to be talking about two major themes, the theme of curse and the theme of blessing. The curse that's described in this passage is not just the natural consequences of bad decisions, though it is that. But the curse described here is actually something that God actively brings upon people who live in a way that is disloyal to his covenant stipulations. Likewise, the blessing is something that he actively brings upon his people who live in accordance with the covenant stipulations that we looked at in detail from chapters 12 to 26. What is the content of the curse? What is the content of the blessing? He doesn't actually share with us in this passage, but we're going to look at it in detail, in some ways painful detail, over the next few weeks. But for this week, we get a sense of the big picture, and that is God is setting before his people a choice. And the choice is blessing or cursing. The choice is life or death. The choice is loyalty to the covenant or disloyalty to the covenant. 
And it recalls to our minds the very first parents of humanity, Adam and Eve, who were placed in a garden and they were given a choice represented by two trees. The choice of life or the choice of death. The choice of obedience to not eat of the forbidden tree or disobedience and to eat it. The choice is plain and it's clear. And as we think about the choice before Adam and Eve, or as we think about the choice that is put before Israel in this passage, we say to ourselves, well, of course I'm going to choose the blessing. How foolish would you have to be to choose the way of cursing? It's so readily apparent that we would choose the way of obedience. But to say such a thing is to fail to appreciate two things. One, the reality of that ancient serpent, Satan, who showed up in the garden and was part of tempting the people of God to distrust God and to be disloyal to his covenant. And we also, on this side of Adam and Eve's fall into sin, underestimate the power of the sinful nature that is at work with us, leading us to distrust God and to choose the way of cursing. If we're going to avoid the curse, we need to be clear. And we need to be clear about what God's law requires. We need to be clear about who we are. We need to be clear about the effect of disobedience, and we need to be clear about the remedy for disobedience. And that's what this passage lays out for us. So let's start at the beginning. And that is, to avoid the curse, we need to be clear on what the law requires. We begin in verse 1 with these words. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. Before you get into the actual content of what Moses said, let's just first acknowledge uh, potential difficulty. Uh, we've said from the beginning, Moses is the author of this book of Deuteronomy, and yet here we have Moses spoken of in the third person. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people. What's, what's going on here? Did Moses not write this? Moses is absolutely the primary and the source author of all of the content of Deuteronomy. But that doesn't mean that there weren't editors who came and helped to put together Deuteronomy as we have it in its final form under the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit as it was for Moses. So Moses then commands the people, and this is what he commanded. He said, keep the whole commandment that I commanded you today. This is not new if you've been with us through the book of Deuteronomy. He said some version of this on many different occasions, and he's emphasizing it now once again, this message. God's people must keep God's law. Absolutely must. The entirety, wholeheartedly, keep the commandments. And he's just laid out for us from chapters 12 to 26 in fine detail what that means to keep the commandment. That's what he's calling them to here. Then he continues, verse 2. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey. So we've seen this command to keep the whole command before. But what's being added here now is a command to set up large stones on a mount called Ebal and to plaster those stones with perhaps some kind of a whitewash that would enable the stones to be written on or maybe engraved into. And this is new. The basic concept is that ancient Chinese proverb which says that the faintest ink is better than the strongest memory. So God wants his people to have a visual reminder of the covenant stipulations, probably the entirety of chapters 12 to 26, and maybe some other pieces as well, written on these stones and placed on Mount Ebal where they can be seen. And verse 8 further emphasizes that you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. That phrase, very plainly, is a phrase in Hebrew used elsewhere to talk about the way that the law was to be taught and exposited. It was to be made plain for the people, intelligible. And so that's what's to be done with these stones so that people can see clearly what God requires, and that is wholehearted obedience to his law. 
From this little section, we can draw a number of uh, conclusions or principles about God's law. The first is that God's law is unchangeable. You don't ask people to write things in stone that you intend to change. In fact, we have a phrase that says it's written in stone. That means it doesn't change. God's law is written in stone because it is a reflection of his character that does not change. His law cannot change because God cannot change. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, does not say, I've come to change God's law. But this is instead what he says in Matthew 5, 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. He does not come to change God's law, but Jesus comes to fulfill or to accomplish God's law. His law does not change. Robert Murray McChain, a Scottish preacher from a prior generation said, it is an unchangeable law for he is an unchangeable God. Therefore, ungodly men have an unchangeable hatred to that holy law. You see, it's the fact that God's law doesn't change which makes us hate it. Because it's like running into a rock, a stone that doesn't move. And we want to reshape the law around our pet sins and our favorite wicked behaviors, and yet God's law doesn't budge. It stands as a witness and a condemnation to our sinful hearts and actions. And so until we are made new, we hate God's law. And we want to put it out of our minds. We want to suppress the truth about it. But there it stands like these stone monuments are going to stand. It does not change. The second thing we see from this passage about God's law and is that it is intelligible. It's intelligible. They're to write the words plainly. Because the message of the law is plain. Now, we're looking at this some 3,000 plus years after it was written. And so we have to struggle a little bit to understand the historical and cultural context of God's law. But much of it is actually quite plain, even still 3,000 plus years later. The reformers, who we remember today on this Reformation Sunday, uh, recovered that truth that had gotten lost in the midst of Roman Catholic abuses of Scripture in the Middle Ages. And they had a doctrine called the perspicuity, or a way of speaking about Scripture, called the perspicuity of Scripture, which is the most terrible name for what it describes. <laughs> Namely, it means that the Scriptures are clear. And so therefore, you don't have to have it explained to you by the priest, but all of God's people should be reading God's Word because the Scriptures are plain. The message is clear. The message of salvation is simple enough that a child can understand. Not to say that there aren't difficult parts, parts, but the, the whole of it is clear. And so if you read your Bible on your own, you can thank the Reformers today because it was they who insisted that the people of God have the Word of God in their own language so that they could read it for themselves. God's Word is plain. And it's no plainer than what we find here in 27, 26. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm to the words of this law by doing them. That's plain. Don't do this, all of this, you're cursed. That leads us to the third thing we can say about God's law from this passage, and that is that it's not only intelligible, it's not only unchangeable, but it is obligatory. It's obligatory. God's moral law is binding on all people at all times, in all cultures, in all places, through all of history. It is the reflection of his holy and righteous character. It is not as though some people opt in and say, I want to live in a universe where God's law exists, and other people say, I want to live in a universe where God's law does not exist. It is like the law of gravity. It is true for all times and all people in all places, and if you ignore that law, it will break you. And if we ignore God's law, we too will be broken. And what does God's law require of us? God's law requires of us wholehearted obedience to every part at all times, in all places. That's what the law requires. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact, as we lay out that requirement, 
that this law is a gift of God's grace. Because your immediate response to that might be, gosh, I wish God hadn't given us his law. But the reality is, is that God gives his law to his people in the context of grace. It is a gift. Remember, he rescued them out of Egypt. Before they had done anything, when they didn't even know him, he rescued them and gave them his law as his people. Now he's bringing them into a land that he had promised to give them, which is a reminder of his faithfulness. And in the context of his grace and faithfulness and bringing them into this land, it's there that he tells them to set up these stone monuments with a reminder of my requirements and what I ask of my people whom I have graced and blessed. As one Old Testament scholar puts it, even in physical symbolism, the law is grounded in grace. These stone monuments are set into the ground of God's grace giving them this land. And so it is also for us. God's law is a gift of his grace. So what does God, his law require of us? It requires of us wholehearted obedience. The second thing we see in this passage is that to avoid the curse, we need to be clear on who we are. We need to be clear on who we are. And so Moses makes that clear in this little transitionary section, starting in verse nine. We're passing over a few verses, uh, five and following that we're gonna come back to in a moment. But in verse 9, Moses and the Levitical priests together announce this to the people of God. They say, keep silence and hear, O Israel. Now that phrase, hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, that phrase is used elsewhere in Deuteronomy. But this is the first time he tells them to keep silence and hear. What he's about to say to them is very important. They need to hear this particularly. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Now, we know that earlier God had already adopted these people as his own. He had made them his own. He had entered into covenant with them. He had given them his law. But this is a renewal of that covenant and a fresh reminder of who they are. You, he says in verse 9, you have become the people of the Lord your God. Now, what is the necessary response and consequence of this identity as God's people? Well, it's this particular imperative, verse 10. You shall therefore, because you are God's people, you shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and statutes. But do you see the order there? You can't miss this. The order is, by God's grace, by his unconditional election, on account of his love, you are his people. And now, because you are his people, this is the way you should walk. Many of us think that God's word says this. This is the way you should walk. And if you walk this way good enough, long enough, faithfully enough, then you will be his people. But look at the text. And this is not the only place that shows it. Even when he gives us the Ten Commandments, he says, I'm the Lord your God who redeemed you out of the house of slavery, out of the, out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. This is who I am and what I've done for you. Now, this is how you should live. And so he says here, you are my people now because of that, not to earn that, but because of that, this is how you should live. It is important that we as Christians today understand that what we do flows out of who we are. We do not do so that we may become, rather we are. And because we are, we do. That's what he's driving home for us. If you don't understand this, then you will live on what Jerry Bridges used to call the performance treadmill. And the performance treadmill is the mentality that many Christians live with where you are running, doing everything you can, and you're constantly wondering if you've gone far enough to be accepted by God. 
Again, this is the reality of where many people were living in the Middle Ages when, before the Reformers showed up and reclaimed the truth of the gospel, is that people were living in such a way as to wonder, have I done enough good? Have I avoided enough sin? Have I given enough money? Have I served enough? Have I, have I done enough to finally be accepted by God? And they would go to their graves not knowing if they had done enough. And the Reformers came back and said, wait, that's, that's actually not the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God so that no one can boast. It's not dependent on how fast you run on that treadmill. Your acceptance with God is not based on your performance on the treadmill. It's based on Christ's performance on the cross. And if Christ has died for you and risen from the dead for you, then you are a new creation. And as a new creation, this then is how you should live. In obedience to his commandments, not that you might become, but because you are. If we're going to avoid the curse, we must be clear on who we are. Thirdly, to avoid the curse, we need to be clear on the consequence of disobedience. In my Bible, we turn the page and we're gonna go ahead to verse 11, where Moses is going to deliver a charge to the people about a particular ritual that they're to perform once they enter into the promised land. And this is the instructions he gives in verse 12. When you've crossed over the Jordan, the Jordan is the river that separates them where they are, they're on the plains of Moab, about to cross into the land of promise. When you've crossed over into the land of promise, over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. And now he's going to list the 12 tribes of Israel. These are the people of, uh, descended from Jacob, descended from Abraham. And so he names six, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. These six standing on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Then these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. So the 12 tribes of Israel standing on two mountains, one representing blessing, one representing cursing, and the people divided right down the middle. What is significant about this ritual and why are these two mountains chosen? Perhaps it's random, but we know better. This location is significant because of something that goes all the way back to the days of Abram, later called Abraham. And if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, God had told, he had told Abraham, go down to this land that we know now as the promised land, Canaan. And this is what happens when he's there. In chapter 12, starting most of the way through verse 5. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Abram builds this altar at a place called Shechem, the place where God first promises them that this is going to be the land he's giving them. Now, here's what's interesting that you might not know unless you're up on your Israel geography. This place where God promised Abram that he was going to give him the land at Shechem is in a valley with two mountains on either side of it. Can you guess what the names of those mountains are? Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And in the middle, God's promise that I'm going to give you this land at Shechem where he built an altar to worship. Well, this is interesting, because now as the people of God are crossing into the land, they're to go to this place as a matter of first importance, and to these two mountains that are going to represent blessing and curse, with the middle being God's promise that I'm going to give you this land to dwell in. It recalls to mind again the first Eden, where God places Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And in that garden, he places a tree, two trees, representing blessing and curse. If the people choose the way of blessing, presumably they will remain in the land of Eden. 
If they choose the way of curse, they will be put out of Eden. And we know they chose the curse and were put out of Eden. Now, many years later, <clears throat> the offspring of Abraham show up in a new Eden, a land that God has promised. And they are given another geographical reminder of the choice that is always before them, the choice of blessing or the choice of curse. With the promised blessing that if you will walk in my ways and choose the way of blessing, you will remain in this land. And the threatened curse, if you choose disloyalty, then like your first parents, you will be put out of my place and my presence. So that's what's going on here. We have a reminder that the choice is again put before the people of God. Will it be the way of blessing or the way of cursing? Now Moses is going to list off 12 particular actions that represent the way of the curse. When we read through those 12 curses, you might have said to yourself, why does he choose these 12 things? It seems like something of a random list. We might have expected him maybe even just to walk through the Ten Commandments again or, or something else. Well, we should say a couple of things. First of all, this is not an exhaustive list of the kinds of things that bring God's curse. We might even say it's not even a summary of the kinds of things that bring God's curse. It is a representative list of the things that bring God's curse. Everything from 12 to 26, if we break it, brings God's curse. But if we were to look at these 12 things in particular that Moses highlights here as the sources of God's curse, we can see a couple of things that they have in common. First of all, what these all have in common is that they tend to be sins that are difficult to prosecute. They all have an element of secrecy to them. And it's as though what Moses is saying here is that though you may not suffer judgment in this world for these things, you need to know that these things bring the curse nevertheless, and God is the one who is bringing it. And after each of those 12 things, the people are to say, amen. May it be so. We are agreeing that doing these things deserves the curse. So that's what they're saying over and over and over again. Now, as we look through these things, we can see that they all sort of have this private nature about them. Uh, cursed be anyone who makes a metal or carved image. Who's an idolater? Well, we could see somebody making a carved image, but notice that it says he sets it up in secret. It's a secret idolatry. And what Moses reminds us is, secret or not, this brings God's curse. Or, cursed be anyone who dishonors his father and mother. That could be an obvious kind of a dishonoring, which has its own penalty according to the law. But it could also be the sort of thing that happens in the heart that nobody else sees but God himself. And it's cursed, he says. Or, moving a neighbor's landmark. This is very easy to do. Neighbor might not even notice. Easy to deny. I didn't move it. This behavior is cursed by God. Misleading a blind man on the road. Who's going to know? Misleading somebody, deceiving somebody, easy to hide and cover up, but God sees. Uh, perverting the justice due to a sojourner. In other words, not giving what is due. That's very easy to keep secret. And then a number of sexual sins and perversions are mentioned. Striking down a neighbor in secret, shedding innocent blood because you've received a bribe. All of these things are secret sins. And the message is God sees. Let's just look at one of these in particular. Verse 24, cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret and all the people shall say, amen. Does this mean that the person who strikes down his neighbor in public is not cursed? Of course, that's not what it means. The point is that whether it's seen and judged by men or not, God sees. Now, as I was thinking about this, the thought occurred to me that the, the primary way today that people strike down their neighbor in secret is through a practice we call abortion. It is a secret striking down of one's neighbor. It didn't used to be so secret, though. You know, for a time, if a person wanted to kill a child in the womb or a couple wanted to do this, they'd actually have to go to a place like Planned Parenthood where they would run the risk of somebody seeing them, of the shame, of coming to a realization about what they were doing where they might run into people on the sidewalk praying for an end to this evil practice or even someone inviting them to 
Choose the way of blessing rather than the way of curse. And because of this, probably some people did not choose to take the lives of their children. And for that, we can thank God. But now, through the abortion pill, and because of changes that were made during COVID, you don't have to go anywhere to kill the child in the womb. They will mail you the ability to kill that child, and nobody ever has to know. 54% of abortions in 2020, and probably even more now, are done through this secretive abortion pill. Why am I talking about this? I'm not talking about this because this is what the world is doing. I'm talking about this because Christians are doing this. Because Christians who should know better that God is the author of life are actually doing this practice or pushing and encouraging others to kill the life of children in the womb. The world is going to do what the world is going to do because the world lives as though God is not there and God does not see, but Christians... We must recognize that God see. And to the next generation who's being raised in an environment that says this is a reproductive choice that you should have, I remind you that your body is not your own. And that child belongs to God. And we have a responsibility to bring that child into the world once it is conceived and to raise it as godly offspring or to hand it off to one that we pray will. Whether or not the world sees, God sees. And that's true for every secret sin, not just abortion. It's true for sexual sin. It's true for dishonoring parents in our heart. It's true for the various ways that we worship idols and look to other things for our satisfaction and meaning and hope and joy in this life besides God himself. All of these things God sees even if nobody else does. And the scripture says that is cursed behavior, that is choosing the way of the curse. And all the people said, amen. 26 sums it all up for us with these words. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, amen. That's a hard word to say amen to once we begin to understand and recognize what that means. What it means is that to break any single part of the stipulations of God's covenant from chapters 12 to 26, visibly or even in the heart, is to bring God's curse upon you. And it is to say that this is what I deserve. Now, we haven't gotten into the content of the curse, but trust me, we will. And it's bad. And what it and that's what we deserve, is what we're saying. So what does disobedience bring about? Disobedience brings about God's curse. That's the effect, that's the consequence. But even in the midst of this bad news comes some good news. And so in the fourth piece, we see that to avoid the curse, we need to be clear on the remedy for disobedience. We need to be clear on the remedy. I hope at this point you all recognize that based on what we've seen, you're under the curse. And so I hope that you then can appreciate this remedy for disobedience that we're going to look at. So going back to verse 5, we see this interesting instruction. On the same Mount Ebal, where they're to set the stipulations very plainly for all the people to see on the Mount of Cursing, They're also to build something. And this is what he says in verse 5. There on Mount Ebal, you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones, and you shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. There, on the Mount of Cursing, I want you to build an altar and rejoice. I'm not asking you if you feel like rejoicing to rejoice. I'm telling all of you people of God, make these sacrifices and rejoice on the mountain that symbolizes the cursing that is coming on you if you do not adhere to everything written in this law. What is going on? How could one rejoice? 
on the mountain that symbolizes the curse that we are under. Well, I hope to tell you. They do do this. And if you go on reading after Deuteronomy, you come to a book called Joshua. Joshua is the story of the people crossing over and doing all the things that God had said. And in Joshua chapter 8, starting in verse 30, you can read how the people do this. They build the altar of uncut stones that God had told them to do. And they make sacrifices and they rejoice. They follow it out to the letter. In the early 1980s, some archaeologists were doing some excavating on Mount Ebal. And on this mountain, they uncovered some stone ruins. And these stone ruins were ruins of uncut stones. And these uncut stones had a, a ramp leading up to them, which instead of stairs, which may not sound significant until you know from the book of Exodus that when they built these altars, they were not to have stairs, they were to be led with a ramp. And so many archeologists at the time said, we believe that this may well be Joshua's altar that he built when they fulfilled God's command to do it. In 2019, as another group of archeologists were sifting through the dirt from the excavation at this possible altar, they found an iron amulet. And this amulet was, it was you know, small enough to fit in the palm of your hand and it was a piece of iron folded over and they, knew that there was writing inside, but they couldn't open it without doing damage to it. So they had to send it off to some specialists in the Czech Republic who have the ability to look through iron with special machines, and they were able to decipher what was written on this amulet that they found on Mount Ebal at this altar site. And this, in just this spring, 2022, this is what they revealed the amulet said. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed by the God YHW, which is short for Yahweh. You will die cursed. Cursed. You will surely die cursed by Yahweh. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Now, probably you don't have this on your precious moments bookmark for your Bible. <laughs> and probably you've not found it yet on a refrigerator magnet to remind you of this fabulous truth. Cursed, cursed, cursed. 10 out of 23 words are cursed. There's a message that's being proclaimed loudly through this amulet. Now, why would anybody have carried around an amulet that says, cursed, 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 you will die cursed, cursed by Yahweh, cursed, cursed, cursed. Why would you do that? What a downer. <laughs> well, Dr. Scott Stripling, when the archeologist who's leading this, expedition, this is what he says about it in the context of an interview. He says, this is a self-imprecatory curse with the author saying that they are binding themselves, saying that these curses will happen to them if they violate God's covenant. More importantly, the amulet was found in the altar context. This was to say that if they broke the covenant, they would come to the altar as taking responsibility for their actions. In other words, they're reminded by the amulet of the promise of cursing for breaking any of the stipulations God lays down in his covenant. But they come to the mountain of cursing where they find there an altar where sacrifices would be made. And in some way, in that context, they recognize they're a solution, a potential remedy for the curse. Well, how is this good news? Because I believe what we see here on this altar built on Mount Ebal is an early picture, a foreshadowing of another mount that we call Calvary, a mountain of cursing, where Jesus Christ, our Savior, went up. And while no physical altar was built, he made the cross an altar. And thereon he gave his life as a sacrifice. In fact, the scripture says he gave his life becoming a curse for a cursed people so that we who deserve the curse at that mount of cursing could instead receive a blessing. Paul puts it this way in Galatians chapter 3. He says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, and here he's quoting Deuteronomy, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law. 
Paul says this is still true in the context of the New Testament. <coughs> Cursed is everyone who does not abide by God's moral law. You are under a curse, every single part of it. But then he goes on to say the good news in verse 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, also from Deuteronomy, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. He says that Jesus Christ on the cross took the curse of our sins and our unfaithfulness to the covenant stipulations upon himself so that we who were unfaithful could receive the blessings that his obedience perfectly merited. That's what was happening at the cross, this great exchange. The one who deserved blessing took cursing so that we who deserved cursing could receive God's blessing. And how do we receive that blessing? He tells us it is by faith. By faith. And by faith alone. We receive it as a gift that God freely gives to all who will receive we can put it in the language of Deuteronomy 27 this way, that Christ went up Mount Ebal to bear the curse for our breaking of the law so that we might go up Mount Gerizim to enjoy the blessings of his obedience to the law. And those blessings are available to every single one of you today. So if you find yourself saying here today, I'm aware of the curse. I'm aware that I have not done everything this law required. I'm aware that maybe there are parts of it I disagree with and I find distasteful, but, but even those parts I agree with and could say amen to, I have broken. And if there is any justice in God, what I deserve is the curse. I came to that place in my life. I remember I was in college and I realized this, I deserve exactly the kinds of curse that this book goes on to detail. And I was without hope until I understood that Christ became that curse for me. If you are aware that you deserve God's curse, my exhortation to you today is run to Jesus. He bore the curse for you that you might receive the blessing. And as you run to Jesus, leave behind your life of thumbing your nose at God's law and God's presence and reality. It's called repentance. Not going on living the way you were, but turning and now living as one of God's chosen and beloved people in obedience to his law. When this change happens in you and you realize that Christ has borne the curse for you and there's no more curse, then the law becomes something you no longer hate, but you actually can love. And you can say things like, oh, how I delight in your law, how I love your law. Like, how can you say that? You can only say that if you understand that the curse the law carries has already been absorbed by another in your place then you can love it. Robert Murray McChain says, you have no more to fear from the law as a Christian than you will have after the judgment day. Imagine a saved soul, he says, after the judgment day, when that awful scene is passed, when the dead, small and great, have stood before that great white throne, when the sentence of eternal woe hath fallen upon all the unconverted and they have sunk into that lake whose fires can never be quenched. Would not that redeemed soul say, I have nothing to fear from that holy law. I have seen its vials poured out, but not a drop has fallen on me. Well, so may you say now, O oh believer in Jesus. As surely as you will on the day after the judgment, you can say now. When you look upon the soul of Christ scarred with God's thunderbolts, when you look upon his body pierced for your sin, you can say, he was made a curse for me. Why should I fear that holy law? You don't have to. You can love it, embrace it, study it, appreciate it in all of its nuances and all of its heart exposingness and rejoice that the curses it promises have been borne by another and the blessings it promises are your possession by faith and faith alone. And then you can say, well, Christ has paid the price for all my sins, so I'm going to go on sinning without fear. And if you say that, you're an idiot. <laughs> an idiot. And, and one who hasn't understood what Christ has done for you and one who probably hasn't actually received what Christ has done. Because to see Christ on the cross bearing the curse for your sins changes you. It changes your posture towards the law. 
as something you love and want to do, not hate. Thomas Watson writes, mercy is not for them that sin and fear not, but for them that fear and sin not. God's mercy is a holy mercy. Where it pardons, it heals. Where we have received pardon, we also receive healing to begin to increasingly walk in the ways that are laid out for us in God's holy word, summed up under these two headings, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as himself. If you are under God's curse today, there's only one thing to do. Run to Jesus today. Run and fall upon him, asking for mercy, and he will give it, and you will be saved. And for those who have trusted in Christ, remember that he has borne the curse and the law holds no terrors for you. You are his beloved people. And as such, walk in all of his good and holy commandments. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that in Christ we can say we have no fear of this holy law. The terrors of God have nothing more to do with us. We are saved. And Lord, may that knowledge freshly wash over us today. That on that Mount of Calvary, Christ bore the curse. That we might, by faith alone, receive the blessing. And may we be freshly stirred to walk in all of his ways as a response of love and gratitude for what you've done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.